Hello and welcome to Saver Sounds. My name is Nick Wood, an international broadcast journalist working alongside Saver Santi Animal or Siva Animal Health, the global veterinary health company. And we have a fascinating discussion coming up in this edition. So let us dive straight into the subject of precision farming. One of the real advantages of doing this job is you get to talk to some people with very big brains. And we have two of those large brains at the end of my microphones today. Daniel Berkmans, who is a professor in the Department of Biosystems at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, which I am told by him dates back to 1425. Daniel hasn't been around that long, but he has co-authored over 300 peer-reviewed scientific publications. And from Saver, we are joined by the head of that company's growing worldwide data team, Thomas Lewiner. He graduated as an engineer, but now holds not one, but two PhDs in mathematics and computer science. He's been a researcher and a professor at the University of Rio de Janeiro, and latterly worked as lead data scientist for the Boston Consulting Group. So I am in very learned company. Let's start with the subject of precision farming. Professor Berkman's Daniel, a really simple question to start off with. What exactly is it? So precision livestock farming is um, a technique where you monitor animals in real time every second, day and night, and the idea is to support the manager with objective measurements. So it's a support system. It will never replace the manager, but it gives him objective data on the animal response that can come from senses, sound, image, doesn't matter. But then he, he should be helped in taking decisions. So that is the whole idea of precision livestock farming. So does the cost of installing the technology and the fact that you're doing all this monitoring mean that this approach is only really suitable for the big integrated meat producers rather than smaller farms? Yeah, you know, because the big farms, what we call the industrial farms, they invest to develop the technology but the cost of technology is depending on the units produced. And because, let's say, 80% of the meat, milk, uh, eggs are produced by maybe 4% of the producers, but because they develop the technology or they invest in it, very small farms can use it because it will be very cheap. If you look, compare it to, like, cell phone. A cell phone... Yeah, they sell it expensive to us, but in reality, it's a very cheap thing. It has become cheap. This is in the market of 7.7 .7 billion humans, but the market of livestock is much and much bigger. So it must be very cheap, that technology. Yeah, that in this, in this period of development, it's still expensive, is normal, but soon it will be very cheap also for small farmers. Thomas, Professor Lewiner, let's bring you in here and you and your team have the job of analyzing this data and helping your customers with management strategies that often follow. And you're often dealing directly with those producers or customers. So talk to me about continuous monitoring and different sizes of farms. So I fully agree that the precision farming is a, is a huge opportunity uh, if it is well done. Uh, and uh, and I fully agree that the farmers that we see, small ones, medium ones, big ones, they're all squeezed with a lot of uh, very operational issues where uh, data can help. And I think it can help uh, on a very immediate reaction. I mean, when you have a, a, an issue on your farm, you need to react fast. And having this 24-7 uh, monitoring gives you a, a, a big hint of uh, what you can do and, and to do it faster and to solve the problem faster. They're also squeezed to take a step back sometimes and analyze where they're going and what are the big levers and the big uh, sources of, uh, of improvement. And I think if you combine this 24-7 monitoring with uh, a more global analysis with a lot of, of field expertise, 
then you, you, you get the most of the data. You have a bit the operational, the tactic, and the strategic time, as usual. And uh, precision farming is a lot of on the operational side to start with. And I think we can help our customer to go to the tactic and strategic one. Let's get practical for a moment and ask about the actual kit that is used to get this data. And I gather here, Daniel, that you and your team have developed some systems of your own. I'm quite happy for you to talk about them here, about your own technology, as long as we are clear that you do have an interest. Well, a, a very nice example is a spin-off also from our team that is Sound Talks. Sound Talks in one word, Sound Talks. They do real-time sound analysis of the sound produced by the animal for infection detection. Now, the idea, what a lot of researchers have, is that you need many sensors and that you need like sensor fusion, a lot of data, a lot of signals. That is completely untrue. Living organisms like humans and animals they tell in many ways the status, the way you walk, the way you talk, the, your position, the way you eat, you drink. There is, the key is you measure a few things, as limited number as possible, but you measure them accurately enough and continuously. That's the, that's the point, continuously. And in the evolvement of the signal, you learn to interpret. And whether you do it by sound or by image or by sensor, doesn't matter. You have to learn to interpret a very simple continuous measurement. But it must be an objective measurement. And that goes against to what I see in a lot of conferences where there is like researchers combining three 3D cameras, but it's too expensive. It is ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. The reason is that a lot of those people are engineers like me and they like the complexity of it. But you have to do the other thing. You have to start from the process. You see, the best PhD students are those who are busy with the animal and they observe it and then they translate that into technology. Thomas, we should be looking at the animals. As, I think that's that's very true. In, in the pure data side, we came from a, a, let's say a big data approach where you had companies that have no knowledge of the sector, but that have enough data to pretend they know everything. And sometimes it works, I have to admit. But here we're in a very different configuration. We're more with small smart data that we can combine with the expertise, uh, veterinary expertise, technician expertise, or customer expertise, and this is more in decision support model. And for that, you need to have a data which is uh, powerful enough uh, to, to really detect something you can act on and uh, that is well understood by all the parties. And, and that's, uh, in that sense, you don't need a lot of sensors, or at least you don't need all of them at once. But uh, having one well-designed uh, information Ideally through a sensor, but it, it could come from other sources too, from the builds typically. Uh, you, you can already help a lot uh, the customer. You are dealing with the full spectrum of animals with your data analysis, but probably the biggest groups at the moment are poultry and swine. So just follow on from Daniel there. What are the key factors that you and your team are looking at? So I think if you want to... to, to uh, work on data, it's good that you also provide data, that you don't only uh, use customer data, but you have to link it to them. So we have the CHIC program in poultry, we also have GPS and slaughter respiratory check. We have data coming from uh, investigation unit, from uh, autogenous vaccine. That's the data we can provide to a customer. Uh, we have very long-standing relation with customers, so we know them very well. We have a lot of information in the people that are interacting with those customer. And we also have the customer data on performance, uh, typically the basic economic performance uh, that you can find in any customer on uh, hatchability for, for hatchery, on feed conversion rate, uh, gross mortality, uh, or slaughter performance and condemnation. In pigs, you would have similar things with uh, maternity production, uh, mortality, gross, feed conversion, and performance at slaughter. Uh, and we provide also the health check at each of those points. So we already have a lot of data. Of course, if we would have sensors 24-7, uh, 
from the data scientist that I am, I would dream <laughs> of working on, on much more data, but we already have a lot to do with, with this existing data. So, and I can say this because I am a farmer's son. Not every farmer has a brain like yours, Thomas or Daniels. They don't tend to be from data management backgrounds or experts in that area. So how the heck are they going to deal with all this information or do they have to pay somebody like you, Daniel, to come and do it for them? So I think it's our job to bring the technology to the level that a farmer can use the technology. You know, the farmer knows his animals quite well. He knows that. He knows the process. He is in the field. You know, the, I've seen that in many cases, that there is people now, the, the farmers of today who are still in business, that is not uh, the people, let's say, the average farmer. Those who can stay in business are good farmers. But what, what I've seen in many projects that it is not somebody with a high degree or a university. No, no, there is people without any education, but they know the process from experience by being busy with that process. That is the real professionals. What we do is just automate that their ears and eyes and nose is there continuously. And they will interpret it, but we have to bring it to that level that it's easy for them to use. Because today for a farmer, it is like us, eh? we use five different techniques to, to connect. We have three word processes. We have, I don't know how many software. Farmers, oh, they have this system and that system. It's not all in one yet, but that will come. That he has one dashboard based upon objective measures from his animals. And it will make it much more simple for him to take the right decision. But it's our job to bring it to that level. OK, thanks for that. A quick break here just to tell you that you can find a lot of the subjects discussed on Saver Sounds on the website togetherbeyondanimalhealth.com. It carries the podcasts themselves, but there are also written articles and access to videos connected with the different subjects and many other subjects, in fact. So it's a really useful resource for information and everything that we discuss on Saver Sounds. So that's togetherbeyondanimalhealth.com, exactly as it sounds. Okay, back to our discussion. Now, Daniel, I'm going to be what's known as the devil's advocate here and say precision livestock farming, well, it's just another cog in the wheel of factory farming, churning out meat from big agriculture. So does welfare by any chance play any part in this type of approach? Look, it is... It is very connected. The welfare of animals, which we can measure in a f based upon physiological measurements, we only need to measure heart rate and movement and we can do it, but the welfare of an animal, that is the mental component in the energy balance of the animal. So it's all about energy. The animal is eating and is using that to maintain the body to produce milk, egg, um, meat, to, uh, to control body temperature, quite important, in that uh, maintainment of the body is the immune system, then there is the physical component of movement, and there is a mental component. That is everything. It's the same for human. Eh? Now, the point is they are very interconnected. Why? Every calorie that goes in the body you can only use it once. The animal can use it to grow, to produce, or to move, or to fight, or to have fun, or in the mental component, or in the immune system, or in the thermal, or in the maintenance. So they are very connected. The main reason for me for precision livestock farming is that um, the first thing is the demand in the worldwide demand for animal products is increasing by over 70 percent so those who say we have to eat plants all fun all nice it will never happen in the next 20 years the world will eat more animal products but then for our own health we need to keep these animals healthy why because 70 percent of the diseases we get are zoonoses they come from animals also COVID. Eh? 
Now, to keep them healthy, the animal needs this energy to maintain the immune system. But when the animal is stressed, as most animals are, the immune system is depressed. So infection of animals immediately connects due to the physiology to that energy equation and animal welfare. And people who think that Europe is worried about animal welfare because we have to be ethical, etc., all through, but more important for us is this health of the animal and for the farmer to produce. So it's really a connected system. Yeah, and we will come to that. Uh, we, in experimental situation, can already monitor the whole thing like we do for humans. I'm monitoring my health continuously. Yeah, my How much goes in the mental component, how much goes in the physics, how much in the immune. We have a system for that. It's commercially available. You can download it from App Store or Google Play. We will bring that to the animal world. We just need the appropriate sensor there. So, but it's very connected. Thomas, animal welfare, SIVA Animal Health is very active, I know from my own experience in this particular world, but can this extend to precision farming and data? Well, I think we have quite a strong experience of uh, animal behavior and welfare from the pets, uh, from the, the Filiway and Adaptil products. We have quite a lot of uh, data and uh, experience to to see that there's a big appeal. I mean, it's not because you a farmer part of a big integration that you're not concerned by the welfare of your animals. Sorry to interrupt you, Thomas, just for a moment, but for the uninitiated, Fellaway and Adaptil are products that recreate a mother's pheromone, the calming aroma from dogs and cats that help to calm down kittens and puppies very often, or more mature animals, respectively. Exactly. And, and that's something that uh, SIVA started quite some time ago. So there's a lot of experience, there's a lot of data internally in SIVA. There's now um, uh, devices that can help uh, monitor also the, the cat behavior. So this is a bit a background where we can really make a difference. Now, on the welfare, one of the nice part is that you, of course, you have a strong correlation uh, between the animal welfare and the farmer welfare, which is very important. And uh, it's not a, a fully correlated with the economical uh, benefits. It doesn't mean that if you go for welfare, you lose money, but you don't have a guarantee that improving again and again on, on welfare, you will earn more and more money. So it's a choice, and I think it's a very good choice for, for everyone. And I think the first one who, who feel it are the farmers, and, and that will reflect on, on the full uh, economy. The, the hard part is to measure it, and that's where data can, can come. We sometimes project our human behavior, our, our human will for freedom onto the animals and consider that an animal is happy if he would, a human would be happy in his place. In intensive farming, it's very hard uh, to, to reach that level, but you can already measure a few things. Sometimes with sensors, the, the kind of um, uh, Professor Beckman is, is developing, Sometimes just by checking that uh, each animal has at least enough access to uh, space, to feed, to water, very basic needs. Those ones uh, also needs to be measured uh, and, and ensured. And uh, that's where you can work operationally to be sure that each and every animal goes. That's a bit of, of investment, but it's worst. Or you can work at least statistically. And that's where the same data that we mentioned earlier can already help. Okay, Daniel, you brought up COVID-19 and zoonotic diseases a bit earlier. Now, there's a huge debate over farming and pandemics at the moment. Now, when you look at the science, the vast majority of such diseases, I think it's agreed certainly by veterinarians and people in the science world, do originate from wild animals, but then they are spread. And there's a lot of concentration around the world at the moment on animals produced for food. So does precision farming have any type of role to play here? Now, what I think is that in Europe, we are not in the game of the cheap bulk meat. That will be China, that will be South America, where it's much cheaper to produce that type of meat. In Europe, we will go for another product. 
to make out to give our farmers a living they need a special product like with this technology they can guarantee that there was animal welfare that there were no diseases or if there is a disease they know exactly when how long because it's all measured so i can see that in europe there is also a public who wants that special product who know that i might eat less meat but i will go for a certain type of meat yeah i'm absolutely convinced of that